Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, and we will begin, as always, uh, by inspiring ourselves for the learning ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement, which comes from the United States Congress. And that is to increase awareness and understanding of the United States Constitution among the American people on a non-partisan basis. Um, before beginning, I want to plug some upcoming programs. We teach the Constitution three days a week to middle high school students and adult learners. And tomorrow, February 5th at 1 p.m., please join me for a conversation with David French of the Dispatch about the First Amendment. It should be illuminating. Next Monday, we are being joined by Joanne Freeman, Robert McDonald, Peter Onuf, uh, and others to discuss the new book, Revolutionary Prophecies, The Founders and the American Future. And you can learn about all that at constitutioncenter.org. We're so um, excited to co-host this program in partnership with the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Our partnership with SNF Agora has led to a series of important programs about the future of democracy and the constitution, and uh, it's spreading a lot of light. Um, and now I'm so honored to introduce our speakers. I'll do that uh, in alphabetical order. William Allen is Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy in the Department of Political Science and Emeritus Dean at James Madison College at Michigan State University and is the author of many books, including those on George Washington, The Federalist Papers and Montesquieu. And Applebaum is staff writer for The Atlantic and a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. She is an SNF Agora Senior Fellow an associate professor of practice at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. She is the author of many books, including most recently, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. George F. Will is a Pulitzer Prize winning com columnist uh, and writer for the Washington Post. He is the author of many illuminating books, including most recently, The Conservative Sensibility, and Daniel Zeblatt is Eaton Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard and Director of the Transformations of Democracy Group at the WZB Berlin Social Science Center. He is the author of many books, including Structuring the State and Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, and including most recently with Steve Levitsky, How Democracies Die. Thank you so much for joining dream team of thinkers about the future of our republic. Uh, Anne Applebaum, uh, George Will, Daniel Zeblatt, and William Allen. I wanna begin with a proposition and that is that the events of January 6th where an armed mob stormed the US Capitol uh, inflamed by uh, demagogic uh, statements and false facts was the founder's nightmare. Uh, they came to Philadelphia uh, with fears of Shays' Rebellion in their mind. That was the group of farmers in Western Massachusetts who were mobbing the courthouses because they didn't want to pay their debts. And Madison said in Federalist 55, in all large assemblies of any character composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. I want to begin with you, George uh, Will, because your recent column about the need to resurrect prudence among American voters argued that grown up American politics requires voters as well as they elect to have the patience to respect constitutional processes. My question to you, and it will be to all of your colleagues, is what is the reason that patience or reason seem to have been displaced by passion and uh, polarization in your piece, you quote Ben Sass uh, on America's junk food diet, the underlying economics of dialing up rhetoric to increase clicks, eyeballs, and revenue. You have other uh, diagnoses of the problem. If you had to sum up uh, the causes of this democratic uh, distemper, what would they be? Well, in a word, populism, but that's a word that didn't exist when the founders were founding. Uh, it's commonly said that they talked so much about the problems of democracy, they must have been tepid, faint-hearted Democrats, not at all. They talked only about democracy because they were determined that we were to have a democracy, but then they, they 
looked at the many failings in the past and the pitfalls in the future and talked about the problems. Madison's nightmare is populism in this sense. Populism postulates first that the people are virtuous or even if they're not, they, in the dyspeptic words of uh, H.L. Mencken, know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. Second, uh, that because they are virtuous and because they need to, uh, prompt fulfillment of their appetites and desires and preferences, there should be no mediating institutions to refine uh, their opinion. It's just fine the way it is. And therefore, there should be no nonsense about separation of powers and slowing things down. That there should be a strong executive with a personal relationship with the masses who can directly uh, articulate what they want and translate it uh, into action. That's in a way what we saw what happened in the morning of and then in the afternoon of the 1st of January. Uh, they clamored, the president said, I agree, uh, let's go get it. Uh, and th of course the, the target of their march was the place where deliberation is supposed to occur and things are supposed to slow down and compromises are supposed to be mandatory. At the heart of this, uh, Jeff, and then I'll subside, is a peculiar and, and simple and simple-minded understanding of representation. Uh, Josh Hawley, when uh, asked why he was doing this, challenging this as well, the people of Missouri want it. And so that's a sufficient uh, explanation. Uh, even if true, of course, it's insufficient. And Mr. Hawley should be sent to his room without dessert and required to read several times Burke's speech to the electors at Bristol, where he said, I owe you my judgment. Uh, I, I, I don't check my judgment at the door and, and, and uh, simply respond to promptings fr from you folks. Uh, so at, at the heart of this is, is an, an entire rejection in the name of populism of uh, separation of powers, the structure to, that exists to encourage prudence and compromise, and finally, a, a simple and, as I say, simple-minded understanding of representation. Thank you so much for summing up your diagnosis of the problem so well. And Applebaum, the same question to you. You wrote in The Atlantic uh, on January 6th or 7th about how America had lost the power of its moral example to the rest of the world. But how would you answer the question of what are the causes of our democratic distemper that led to January 6th? So I'd like to first pick up on something that George just said, which is the concept of virtue, um, which, which the founders did speak about. Sometimes they spoke about it as something that had existed in the Roman Republic that they wanted to um, inspire an American. Sometimes Thomas Jefferson spoke about it as something that was somehow inculcated in, in the American way of life. Um, but they did have an idea that, you know, whatever their political differences, whatever their economic differences, that the electorate, which was, of course, a, a more narrowly defined group at that time, um, you know, in, in, you know the, the nature of its virtue was that it um, was that they accepted this set of virtuous institutions, um, including Congress um, and including the, the rule of law and including the other, you know, the other elements of the political system. And of course, what was so striking about January the 6th was that it was an attack, you know, it wasn't Republicans attacking Democrats, you know, it wasn't actually, what you were not watching was a kind of, was a sort of partisan clash. What you were watching was a group of uh, a part of the electorate, a representative of a part of the electorate that was attacking the system itself. You know, they were attacking Congress. They were trying to prevent Congress from um, from recognizing the the electoral college's vote for the president. Um, they were, you know, they were indiscriminate. They were happy to hang Mike Pence. They were happy to shoot Nancy Pelosi. Um, and they were, and, and it was the system itself, the institutions of Congress, the neutral institutions, you know, with the, you know, the Congress is of course a very political place, but the actual institution is bipartisan. We all share it, you know, we all elect people to go and sit in it. Um, and it's very clear that a part of the American electorate has lost its respect for our neutral and shared institutions. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we could spend the rest of this hour speaking about them. Um, I would point to, to let, me, let me talk about one of them, um, which is the effect that 
um, online and media polarization has on the electorate. Um, the fact that we all now live in separate filter bubbles, that what I see in Google is different from what you see when, we, when you Google the same thing. Um, the fact that we are so deeply divided by what, where we get our information what, and what it is. One of the impacts of polarization is that it, by definition, makes people suspicious of those shared institutions. Because um, if, you're, if you come to see your political opponents as fundamentally evil, or fundamentally wrong, or fundamentally um, illegitimate, um, then the institutions that they occupy or work in also become illegitimate. So we now have a portion of the American electorate that has lost that Republican virtue, that faith in you know in these bipartisan and shared institutions, um, and which sees Congress, the White House, um, you know the CIA, the State Department, the the institutions, the 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 the, the, the fifty the um, officials in fifty states who count votes, um, the electoral system itself as evil, um, and that that is precisely why that movement was so dangerous and precisely why the still relatively high support for it around the country is so dangerous. We now have a part of the American electorate that doesn't accept the system, doesn't accept the rules of the system um, and, and, and is going to go on being challenged in the system in years to come. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Daniel Ziblatt, you uh, are part of projects that are uh, studying this program and you have written about uh, political polarization. Um, and Applebaum just met, mentioned the uh, way that online environments contribute to it. You've talked about asymptomatic polarization. Uh, is that uh, one of the causes of our distempers? And if so, tell us more about it. This was certainly one of the founders' nightmares, what happened on January 6th. But I think in addition to that, it's also the nightmare of people who've studied the breakdown of democracies in the 20th century as well. They're, great Spanish political scientist, Juan Linz, who, who taught at Yale University for many years, uh, you know, was born in Weimar, Germany, grew up in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And one of the things he identified as a great threat to democracy is the emergence of what Anne just described also as anti-system movements. So these are groups or individuals or political parties that don't accept the basic rules of the game, that are willing to use violence to gain power or to cling on to power. And I think in many ways, what we saw on January 6th was that kind of movement. So that's something that we've seen in the breakdown of democracies in other places. You know, We've survived this, but this continues to be a major threat to us. One point I would add though, drawing again on Linz is that one of the things that Linz emphasizes a great danger for democracy is not only the emergence of anti-system movements and parties, but the emergence of, of semi, what he called semi-loyal uh, political parties. And semi-loyal political parties are parties that are essentially establishment parties that play footsie essentially with anti-system groups and that don't unambiguously separate themselves from groups that are willing to use violence to gain and to hold on to power. And you know, he, Linz wrote, wrote about this in the 1970s, looking at the breakdown of democracy in Latin America also looking at the breakdown of democracy in Germany in the 1930s, Italy in the 1920s. And one of the warning uh, sort of signs that he identified as a threat to democracy is when mainstream parties think it's in their interest to at least not entirely unambiguously separate themselves with, with these kinds of forces. And I think my great fear is that what we've seen and part of what we've seen has been exacerbated by the unwillingness of key elements in the Republican Party to sufficiently distance themselves from these groups. Now, after January 6th, you know, uh, certainly some Republican leaders came out and clearly denounced this. That's absolutely right. But in some ways, you know, the, the, the cows had already left the barn. I and mean, the reason we are in this situation, I think, is there's been insufficient uh, distancing from the most extremist elements in our society. In order for democracy to, to endure going forward, there has to be a clear line drawn by both Democrats and Republicans. This kind of behavior is unacceptable and an unwillingness to use these kinds of forces to mobilize support for themselves. So, so I think that's one of the, the great lessons of the 20th century for our current moment. Thank you very much for that answer. That was worth the wait. And thank you friends in the audience for reconvening so quickly. Uh, I, I know you're learning as much from this discussion as I am. Uh, William Allen, you've written so powerfully about uh, the American national character. Um, in, in light of January 6th and the polarization, technological, political, and otherwise that's been discussed, do we still have a single national character? character? And, and how would you uh, 
diagnose through the lens of the founders the cause of our uh, democratic uh, distempers. Well, I uh, thank you. I miss, of course, a portion of this, but I think I heard enough to get a sense of it. And I find myself in a curious position in which I agree with all my those who spoke before me with regard to the general question of what is the danger of the hour. Uh, but I don't agree with the assessment of how we got there. Uh, I think we're somewhat overwrought in describing what happened January the 6th as an insurrection. I don't think it was quite the same as firing on Fort Sumter or the same as the raid at Harper's Ferry or the same as the Whiskey Rebellion where magistrates were tarred, feathered and killed and dragged away from their courtroom. Uh, very targeted and very deliberate. I think this was a mob in the classic sense, in the Elias Canetti sense. Uh, this is a, a, in effect an organism that lost its mind rather than found its purpose. And we must make that distinction with great clarity. It is not so much that they were informed by Trump's purpose and therefore had a purpose. They were simply, as Ann Applebaum pointed out and others have indicated indirectly, people who no longer had confidence and who were outraged by not having confidence more than anything else in the institutions and in the system. So the American character question comes down to that as its central point, as it seems to me. What has eroded confidence in our institutions? Those guardrails, the constitutional guardrails, the republicanism of the system. Uh, George points out how the founders were so emphatically in favor of popular government that they did everything they could to try to protect it. I, I agree completely, that's quite right. But they did so by building in protections against mere majoritarianism. They were understandably concerned that they didn't want to recreate an Athens for one reason only. There is no constitution in majority rule, period. So how did we lose our character? Well, somehow it seems to me it started when we lost faith in all those institutional guardrails, the very republicanism itself. We announced that in 1938, when we said in Caroline Product's case that minorities cannot be protected by majority rule in this system. And ever since then, we've been elaborating a structure in which we try to discriminate protected from unprotected classes. And what does that mean except to communicate that some people shouldn't have confidence in the government? And eventually that means no one should have confidence in the system. So I think we have a much deeper problem than the problem of technology, of the online communication. The whole idea of whether the problem is the people know too much or the people know too little, it seems to me is quite beside the point. The fact is what the people know is not comforting. And we must explore the reasons why what the people know is not comforting. Fascinating, thank you very much for that intervention. Uh, George, uh, Professor Allen, says that the problem is not the guardrails themselves, but the fact that we've lost faith in their character. Uh, do you agree that the, the institutions are holding, but it's the people's faith in them are not, or do you disagree? And, and if that is your diagnosis, then how, can, how, how would you resurrect people's faith in the guardrails? I agree that they've lost faith in them to the extent that they even understand them. I don't think we have a rising generation of Americans who are taught what they are and why they are what they are. That is what, what premises uh, underlie them and what evils they're supposed to, to uh, prevent. So first of all, there's a, a vast failure of, uh, of uh, public education, ongoing civic education. It seems to me a, a, a nation that cannot educate elites that uh, and an intelligentsia and educators that actually believe in the nation's premises is, is uh, ominous, particularly when you are, as we are, a creedal nation that believes certain things as, uh, as constitutive of what it means to be a citizen. I think it's very, it is important to understand that because the events of the first of Jan uh, 6th of January filled our television screens. It looked as though they were filling in a way the nation. It was a pretty small up up uprising. Uh, 
Shea's Rebellion was probably a large, although trivial in size, was probably a larger percentage of the population at the time than those people were on the 6th of January. It's very important to understand that there are 330 million of us in this country. And at any given moment, 323 million of them are not watching cable television or listening to talk radio. They're raising children and fixing the screen door and getting on with life. Uh, so the tone of American life, in part because of, of mass media and graphic journalism, the tone of American life is often set or distorted by uh, graphic images that have no larger resonance in the country. Um, fascinating. Thank you for that. And uh, it, it, I think that the four of you have said in different ways, for read, that Americans have lost faith in the mediating institutions. You did say that in your opening comment. If we're on the solutions round, how can Americans regain their faith in the institutions? So to be clear, I'm not sure that one, it's not that I'm not sure, I'm sure that not all Americans have. Um, what we're talking about is a small minority and you know how you measure that minority is very difficult. Um, one proxy measurement might be the number of Americans who say they sympathized with the insurrection at the Capitol. Um, and that's at one, at one poll that was taken soon after that was 20%. Maybe it's a bit lower now. Um, and maybe that didn't really reflect full knowledge or understanding of the incident. So, but even if we called it 10%, um, that's a very large number of people um, for the rest of us to deal with. And when you think about the consequences of that 10%, I mean, we were actually very lucky in this election that we had state officials like Brad Rafsenberger and others in Georgia who counted the votes correctly, tabulated them correctly and stood by those, you know, stood by the count even when they were under a lot of pressure from the president and from other people in their party to change it. Um, two years from now or four years from now, we might not be so lucky at having those kinds of officials in place. Um, uh, remember some of them are elected officials and the, you know, we, could, we could see this 10% or 20% pushing for the election of a different kind of person. But that means it seems to me that we need to think about the problem in a way that Americans are not used to thinking about this kind of problem at all. And then I mean, to think about it as a kind of insurgency. You know, it's a, you know, it's a, th you know, think about it the way that the Colombian government, for example, um, now thinks about reintegrating um, the FARC terrorists who for, the, for 50 years lived in the jungles, lived off, you know, drug deals and, and, and kidnapping. And once a peace deal was done, had to be brought into society and reintegrated. Um, and some of the lessons from Colombia, from Northern Ireland, from other places where there has been a problem of integrating or, or reconstituting a society after a civil war, when you have people who have graphically different visions of what society is and how it should run, um, some of that thinking, you know, counterintuitive though it seems and far away though Colombia, Northern Ireland may seem from us is something that might help us um, get through this. And this is not a simple or quick, you know, or easy process. And of course it should go along with what George Will talks about which is civic education. It should go along with reform of the internet, regulation of the internet. That's a whole huge um, separate problem we can maybe discuss another time. Um, but thinking about reintegrating an insurgency, you know, leads to some conclusions. For example, one counterintuitive but frequently used method in places like Northern Ireland is that actually you don't focus on the big issues, the existential issues that divide you. So you just don't talk about them. Um, instead, you change the subject and you talk about you, you do constructive projects together. So, you know, at a local level, you build a road or you build a bridge or you bring people together to discuss not their feelings about high politics, but for example, how are we gonna, you know, increase security at the state capital in Ohio? And then you would bring representatives from all different groups to, you know, to say, well, we don't want anyone to be heard in all these different kinds of demonstrations. What do you propose to do? Um, and so getting people to speak about constructive problems like that um, is something that's used, you know, in societies all around the world in that, um, you know, in, in, in that kind of situation. And, and again, it's, as I said, counterintuitive because people think we should argue things out or we should convince each other. Um, actually, we might not be able to convince each other. You know, it might be that if you bring 
one insurrectionist in the room with a constitutional scholar like Jeffrey Rosen, um, they just aren't going to agree. And, and no, no amount of time spent together is going to make them agree. And so instead, they should turn around and go work together at a vaccine clinic or something, you know, volunteer somewhere um, and do some jointly useful project. Um, and that's just, as I said, that's just a, you know, you would have to work out what that meant at the local and regional and state and national level. Um, but that that way of thinking, um, which, by the way, I think the I think the Biden political campaign, the Biden administration, intuitively understands. I don't know if they're using the same rubric, but um, that that what you need to do is not focus on what divides us, but on these other kinds of projects. Um, you know, that's that's a that's a way out. Um, at least if you're talking about reducing violence, ending conflict. Um, that's something that we can, that's a way that officials, mayors, governors can start thinking along those lines. And that, that's a way to, to usefully move forward. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Daniel Zeblatt, we have two powerful uh, guardrails or proposals on the table. George Will emphasizes uh, civic uh, education uh, and talks about bringing people who disagree together to solve constructive uh, problems. Um, can you propose the resurrection of a guardrail? And perhaps since we've been talking about some of the populist attacks uh, on uh, counter-majoritarian institutions, do you agree that we need to uh, strengthen the counter-majoritarian checks or, or, or should the institutions become uh, more majoritarian? Well, I think both George and Anne's points are, are really well taken. And what they address are, in a sense, a social transformation. You know, and looking at the level of voters and citizens and, and you know, our, our, politi our political culture needs to change. And I think that's absolutely right. But I think we can also operate at another level, which is at the level of our political elites. Because at, at, uh, certainly our elites and, po and politicians respond to what voters want, but politicians uh, act in ways based on the incentives facing them. I mean, certainly they're constrained by norms and some of these norms and, and soft guardrails have decayed over time. And so I, I just don't think it's going to work any longer to kind of wag our finger at misbehaving politicians and say, no, no, you, that's not inappropriate. This is unprecedented. You can't behave this way. I think we have to address the incentives facing politicians so that it's no longer in their interest to try to tap into these groups. Because at some level, one might say that throughout American history, at least 20% of the American electorate, maybe not as mobilized as this population, but has, has had, there's been an illiberal strand in the American electorate. And 20% is a, is a fair estimate if one could do survey research going back to the 19th century, right? So the question is not what, you know, how to eliminate that segment of the population or to transform them, but rather how to make it so that politicians don't think it's in their interest to tap into those groups. And I think one way of doing this, I mean, one of the fundamental problems facing our country today is that we, that today, more than any point in the 20th century, the correlation between population density and partisanship is, is much higher than ever before. So in other words, Republican, as a, in the past, Republicans and Democrats had both urban and rural wings. Today, we have two parties, one party, the Democratic Party, which essentially represents urban areas, another party, which represents rural areas. These, di the districts they represent are increasingly homogenous. And so there's very little incentive for a Republican and a 90% Republican district, a uh, Republican member of Congress to try to reach out to more moderate stances or to separate themselves from these most extremist wings of our society. And so if anything, they're afraid of being primaried on the right. And so what I would suggest is that we need to transform the incentives facing our politicians. And so, you know, this is, this is a, I know this is a steep hill to climb, but just to give you one very blunt example, I mean, the Electoral College certainly is something, if we had nationwide elections, you would have a transformed set of incentives facing presidential candidates. Uh, if you, if, you know, the HR1, the Senate Bill 1, which expands voting rights, if we made it easier for people to vote across the United States, essentially we would be increasing the, the, uh, the need to appeal to majorities. I mean, at the end of the day, I think at this, at the current moment, the Republican Party is, is relying on crutches to win power. I mean, it doesn't need to win majorities to win power. I think competition is the great moderator. If we had increased the level of competition in all, all of our districts, uh, there would be a need to moderate. And so, you know, I think it, the, any, any institutional reforms that we could, you know, talk about the institutional reforms, any institutional reform that increases competition I think would increase moderation. And so if those are majoritarian reforms, I think we need to do that. And to be clear, you know, I think, you know, I'm all, democratic rule is not just majority rule. That's certainly the case, but democratic rule without majority rule is certainly no democracy. 
Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Allen, your, uh, you, you reframed the uh, problem. Um, how would you reframe the solution of encouraging citizens to recover the virtue and self-restraint that the founders took for granted as part of the national character? In a word, I would follow the example of Washington's farewell address, which quite specifically addressed that question and which elaborated the principle that the institutions cannot be trusted by the people if the institutions do not trust the people. It's a very straightforward formulation. It doesn't require a lot of sophisticated analysis. If we're looking for constructive projects in which to engage people, for example, in 2021, what could be more constructive than to get people to focus on solving the countless numbers of personal crises they're all going through in the presence of a disease than getting together to figure out how to open their schools and how to run their businesses, rather than being in the supine position of waiting for instructions. This binary structure of thought we have, that there are some who know, and the vast number who have to be deprogrammed, formed, tutored, otherwise structured for participation in free government, is exactly upside down. The solution is a powerful dose of humidity on the part of those who think they know. And the recognition of the necessity to abandon the country to the potential of goodwill abandonment by the people. Because trust in the people ultimately recognize that, recognizes that the people themselves must make these decisions. They can't be made for them. They can't be shaped by institutions. They can't be shaped by redesigning the democracy. They can't be shaped by someone speaking from on high. What we have to understand, what has been true from the beginning, what James Madison rooted over countless times for more than 35 years, is we've reached that point at which Madison described where the power stands in the hands of the suffrage when the suffrage has passed into the hands of the propertyless many. For all practical purposes, that's where we are. And either they will exercise that power with the prudence George Willis talked about, or they'll exercise it otherwise, but in the main, they will make their choices, including their bad choices with goodwill, and therefore there's a potential for goodwill abandonment. Having been born as I was before the era of lynching had expired, and having lived through for the first substantial portion of my life, the era of Jim Crow, I'm very much aware of where majoritarianism can go astray. <laughs> I remember George Wallace campaigning and saying, I will not be out niggered. I also remembered how he ended his career. We have to recognize that we cannot shape this experience from an elite pedestal. We can learn a lot, historically speaking. We can communicate with one another in curious and introspective and speculative ways, which profits us philosophically and otherwise, but none of that has anything to do with the character of the people who must sustain the nation. The people must be trusted before the institutions can operate properly. Thank you very much for that, uh, George. But Bill raises a profound question that uh, the founders struggled with. As uh, we learned from uh, Federalist 51, uh, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. M Madison was uncertain about whether the people had enough virtuous self-restraint to govern themselves. And I'd like your candid thoughts about whether in light of the online environment that we are seeing, you ultimately believe that the people can muster that virtue. And I want to put a very concrete example on the table. The New York Times a week or so ago ran a piece about a woman who has uh, become an enthusiastic QAnon conspiracy theorist. As it happened, she was a high school and college classmate of mine. She had the beneficiary of a superb elite education, but that did not prevent her from being radicalized by these algorithms into conspiracy-minded falsehoods. In light of these incentives, do you believe that the people have enough virtue to be governed by reason rather than passion? Let's, and if not, what can be done about it? 
before getting to virtue, do they have enough information, Jeffrey? The bigger the government gets, the less people know about it relative to what it's actually doing. In the 19th century, they could wrap their minds around the great issues. Immigration became came later, but the expansion of slavery into the territories, uh, internal improvements as we Whigs still call infrastructure. Uh, they were big issues, the disposal of public lands. People could sort of understand that. A great many people can't understand what the government does nowadays. And I, I, and I, I, I sympathize with that. As you know, Jeffrey, I, I'm, I've been tiresome for years now about the, the modern presidency and how it's distorted uh, our, our life. The problem with the modern presidency is, is it teaches people bad lessons about government. They want to go back to my definition of populism, the idea that the public will should be instantly trans, uh, translated into action by a strong executive. They're taught this. Uh, Mr. Trump wanted to build a wall, so he declared an emergency and repurposed funds to build the wall that had been appropriated for other purposes. But he could only do that because Congress has, has scattered the legal code with all kinds of uh, discretion that are uh, for, for presidents to seize. Uh, he's declared a national security urgency to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum from our tranquil, placid, not to mention military ally, neighbor Canada. And th this, this sort of applied populism and, he, and, and it was done with the, with the con passive consent of, of a Congress that has simply decided that governing is too much, too tiresome and too time consuming. Uh, and, and so th the way the modern presidency functions, not to mention its ubiquity in our, in our uh, are taking up residence in our in our heads from one end of the day to the other, teaches people bad lessons about the way the government works. Uh, I heartily agree with what Ann said, uh, that uh, change the subject to try and break the fever, get people to relax, take a deep breath, then exhale. Uh, Actually, the president has done that. President Biden's picked up what used to be, uh, isn't quite so much anymore, a hot issue, immigration, to, right out of the box. I wish he'd picked up infrastructure because there's something in it for everyone. It's splittable differences. Everyone gets to build a bridge or an airport and everyone's happy. And you lower the tone because you're in the realm of splittable differences. Many thanks for that. Um, and George just agreed with you about the virtue of, uh, of changing the subject and shaping these deliberations. My question to you is, are, is this distemper, uh, it's obviously not unique to America, but, uh, and given your international perspective, does it make sense to focus on American institutions like the peculiarities of the Electoral College or the incentives of the gerrymandering system? Or are these problems of internet polarization, disinformation and radicalization uh, transnational? And are the solutions therefore transnational and having more to do with things like internet regulations and the structure of uh, conversations among polarized groups rather than uh, reforming uh, the constitution? So I can, although I can imagine that both can be true, um, we can have outdated in institutions in our country and at the same time, um, you know, be part of an, of, of an international um, uh, you know, a, a set of international problems. Um, it's true that one of the one of the reasons I'm so biased to this conversation about it's not just about the internet, but about the media more generally, is that what is happening in America really is very similar to what's happening in other places. I, I mean, I just can't stress it enough how similar. Um, same kinds of language, same kinds of divisions. Um, same kinds of arguments are being made in countries that are really very different from the United States. I mean, I, as, as you know, I spent a lot of time in Poland, which is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's got a, about as different a history from the history of America as any country in the world. Um, and yet it is extraordinary how similar some of the arguments sound there and here. 
Um, and the only explanation for that that I can see is that all democracies are right now being put to the test by some similar sets of problems, I mean, including the, the impact of the internet on, on media, the downgrading of commercial media, um, the, 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 you know, the ways in which the, you know, the, the, the internet focuses your attention and, um, and, 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 and creates divisions between people. Um, so the fact is that that's happening in a lot of places at the same time. So maybe it's not surprising that we're seeing these similar patterns um, in a lot of places at the same time. And I would argue that there, there is a, um, there is an international dimension to the solution. Um, one thing that I know the Biden administration wants to do is find a way to reignite our alliances. So our alliances with Europe, our alliances with democracies of Asia, um, our alliances with democracies actually all around the world. Um, and one of the things I'm worried about that is I'm worried that that will just be a bunch of meetings and some slogans and you know holding hands or I don't know, they go to Berlin and they all have a photograph taken together and that will be the sum of it, actually reinvigorating those alliances, actually um, focusing on some of the international problems that afflict all of our democracies. And one of them is the absolutely crucial issue of internet regulation, which is by the way, happening in Europe. I mean, it's kind of, it's part of the European Union's program for the next few years. It's under discussion in London and Paris, it's, it is gonna happen. Um, and so focusing on doing that together so that we can create an internet that reflects our democratic values of openness and transparency, and transparency, openness and transparency, sorry, um, rather than an internet that reflects the oligarchic values of a few companies and rather than the autocratic internet that, reckon, you know, that China has that, that, that reflects the values of surveillance and censorship. Um, so doing that as a project together would not only reinvigorate our alliances, it would also strengthen all of our democracies. I mean, another big project um, for all of us to do together is to look really hard at kleptocracy and the movement of illicit money around the world and, and the way in which dirty money affect, affects and shapes all of our politics. I mean, it's a terrible problem inside the US, but also um, across Europe and again, in democracies around the world. Those are joint things that, that we could do together. Um, and just as a, one, one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently is the way in which we always assumed that America's involvement in spreading democracy and talking about democracy and leading this democracy alliance around the world since, since the Second World War, we always talked about that as something America did for the world. Um, I suspect we've underestimated the degree to which being part of that group and having that as a national project actually reinforced our democracy at home. Um, the fact that democracy was at the center of our foreign policy um, also meant that, you know, that, that, it was at, that it was at the center of national policy and, and a sense of national, gave us a sense of national purpose in a way that we really underestimated for, for a long time. And so there, there, you know, just, you know, it's not just about, you know, making friends with the EU again. It's about reinvigorating all of our democracies by focusing on how we can make the international environment better for all of them. So, so although I don't disagree that there may be changes we could make here, um, I do think we have always underrated the international dimension and how it affects us. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Daniel, you're getting lots of uh, comments. Uh, Daniel makes some great points, but what can be done about current Republican moves in state legislatures to restrict and make voting more difficult? Other questions about uh, your proposals for the Electoral College, but I, I wonder if you could sort of take up Anne's invitation to make an international comparison are there institutional and political reforms in other countries that have reduced polarization and the influence of faction, such as, for example, ranked cho choice voting, just to take an obvious one, that we might learn from so that we don't make the mistake of assuming that our uh, vexations are unique to our particular institutions? I think that's absolutely right. Our, our, our vexations aren't unique to us, and they're similar trends exactly as Anna's described. And I think the causes are very similar. I mean both demographic changes within countries, you know, it, it, in, in Europe, the, the refugee crisis certainly sparked the rise of a radical right. Uh, even if in many countries there weren't many refugees or it was exactly in those regions where there weren't many refugees within countries where the radical right did the, did the best. But that was certainly a kind of uh, a specter hanging over politics. Uh, uh, social media, internet technology, these are all common causes. 
I guess the, the interesting issue, though, that faces the United States is unlike a, a lot of least of West European countries, where the where radical right parties are, you know, 20, 25, 30 percent of the vote if they get lucky, but at the margins of their political systems, we're in a situation where our, one of our two main parties looks a lot more like those far right parties than it does the its former uh, counterparts, the center right conservative Christian democratic parties of Western Europe. And that that was the group of parties that our center right party used to be compared to. And increasingly, in terms of its ideology and its stance on a lot of these issues we've been talking about, it looks more like the far right parties. The challenge, of course, is that this is one of our two main parties. So in terms of what kinds of institutional reforms have existed in other countries, I mean, I think one, you know, we, we of course, as, as viewers of this know, we have a very old constitution, uh, you know, the oldest written constitution and a lot of the countries that we're talking about in Western Europe, for instance, have new constitutions. And there's a lot of virtues to having our old constitution. But, you know, one interesting dynamic is that over the course of the post 45 period in a lot of Western Europe, a lot of these kind of older institutions have been reformed. Think of the House of Lords, being weakened in, in recent years, or a Swedish upper chamber. I mean, there are a lot of institutional reforms, a lot of activity in the changing of institutions, renewing of institutions. And I think, you know, as, as important as our constitution is, as, and as well as it served us, I think we should also be open to the possibility that at times we need to update our institutions. I mean, you know, what we, we are not, our constitution can't, we cannot treat it as if it's the most unique thing in the world and that nobody, you know, and that it, it can't be, touched. I mean, it's difficult, of course, to reform our constitution, but it's, hap it's happened before the beginning of the 20th century. And I know a lot of people don't think a lot of the progressive reforms were, 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 were all great. But on the other hand, you know, the 20th century was a pretty good century for the United States. And I think it was in no small part to the institutional reforms that clustered at the beginning of the 20th century. And I think the time is ripe for us to begin to rethink some of these reforms and to essentially put us in the same category as a lot of other advanced democracies. Thank you for that reminder that even the most venerable institutions are being reformed abroad. You reminded me of that line from Gilbert and Sullivan's Iolanthe. If there is any institution in Great Britain which is not susceptible to any improvement whatsoever, it is the House of Peers. But of course, they did just re redo the whole thing um, without much fuss. Um, William Allen, you are getting a lot of uh, uh, plaudits in our chat room. Applause, applause for William Allen. Bravo, William Allen, the so-called elites who think they know better than the people are an existential danger to the Republic. My question is, um, is, is your suggestion quote from George Washington's farewell address that the elites that the government should simply uh, trust the people rather than second guessing their wisdom? And, and how, how does that address the, the challenge of my, my, my college classmate who, because of algorithmic radicalization, is embracing uh, falsehoods? Sorry, I think you're muted. The old uh, challenge. Thank you. So, sorry, I <laughs> to to address the tail end of that. I'm not sure how to account for your high school classmate. Uh, I, I'm quite sure of one thing, though, that she wasn't merely a, a passive victim of impersonal forces. Uh, I think that our tendency today to resolve human experience into the passive reception of external influences discounts character too greatly. And that's part of what I was describing earlier. We don't see people as agents, we see them as victims. We don't see them people as who can do things, we see them as people who have to be nursed and nudged as patients, as if there were somehow a na native born class of surgeons tending all the rest of us. I, I think we have to break out of that and, and we have to revert to the model that is present in the Farewell Address. When Washington says, look, I'm not responsible, you're responsible. What I've done, I want you to evaluate, to assess, to hold me to account for, but at the end of the day, you, the people are responsible. And that's the language that makes the difference. And that's the language that was subverted at the start of the 20th century, when the presidential model that George Will complains about arose and was defended by Woodrow Wilson, the so-called tribune of the people who was alone going to express the national voice. Well, of course it was a fiction then, but it was a harmful fiction for it set in train, in motion, all the perverse tendencies of executive power we've experienced ever since then. It isn't the case, it seems to me, that we can reconcile or reduce the American experience to the universal experiences of humankind around the world. Even though human beings are the same everywhere, human institutions are not. 
they are by definition quite distinct. And even when they look alike, they're going to be quite different. So that it is important, I believe, for us to recognize something that is really critical. The United States can cease to exist in its constitutional form. It will not disappear as a geographic space. It will not disappear as a congeries of peoples. It will not disappear in many respects, including all the geopolitical, and can still disappear as a constitutional form. Therefore, the analyses have got to be more sensitive and not assume the perduring, the lasting, the enduring forms of political life, whether here or elsewhere. Deliberate choice is what makes a constitution in the highest sense of the expression, not just evolved experience. And what we have to offer, those who think about these things, is to inform what deliberate choice means. I think that's what Daniel Ziblatt is trying to get at. But you do that in the most interesting way, only by carrying out that conversation directly with the people in the role of public representative. Most of our so-called constitutional experts today who are dreaming about remaking the Constitution are not public officials. They are the Rexford Tugwells of this day, and even he was a public official. <laughs> But they're, they're constantly rewriting, redefining, redesigning constitutions anonymously in some cases. And I pointed out to them, that's quite the opposite of what happened at the founding. Yes, the Federalist Papers were written pseudonymously, but not before those who wrote them had taken public roles in drafting the constitution and presenting it to the people. It is the responsibility of public representatives who most directly determine national character and political prospects. And I will always submit that that is the solution. If the wrong people are in those offices, then those people who think they have better solutions had better get there. Otherwise they should be silent. It is the responsibility of public representatives to carry out discussions directly with the people to inform deliberate choice and eloquent note on which we will have to end this superb discussion because uh, Constitution Center uh, fora, like Supreme Court arguments, must end on time. The only thing I'll ask of our panelists is that we reconvene. I think this discussion was so productive and each of you was so illuminating uh, that I know that we could benefit from uh, another session together. So we'll hope to schedule that before too long. And in the meantime, I want to thank the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins for co-hosting this wonderful panel with us. And I want to thank you, fellow citizens, dear listeners, uh, more than a thousand of you taking an hour away uh, from your busy days um, in order to educate yourself about democracy and the Constitution. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Ann Applebaum, uh, Daniel Ziblatt, George Will, and William Allen for a illuminating, uh, marvelous discussion and hope we can reconvene soon. Thanks to all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.